Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of Splunk.com 2021 virtual. We're here live in the Splunk studios. Um, we're all here getting all the action, all the stories. Garth Ford, Senior Vice President, Chief Product Officer at Splunk is here with me. CUBE alumni, great to see you. Last time I saw you, we were at AWS, now here at Splunk, congratulations on the new role. Thank you, and great to see you again. Great keynote um, and great team, congratulations. Thank you, thank you, it's a lot of fun. So let's get into the keynote a little bit on the, on the product, you're the Chief Product Officer. We interviewed Sean Lice, who's uh, also working with you as well, he's your boss. Talk about the, the next level, because you're seeing some new enhancements. Let's get to yeah. the news first, talk about the new enhancements. Yeah, the, uh, this is actually a really fun keynote for me. So, um, I think there was a lot of great stuff that came out of the rest of it, but uh, I, I had the honor to actually showcase a lot of the product innovation. You know, since we uh, did dot .conf last year, we've actually closed four different acquisitions. We shipped 43 major releases, and we've done hundreds of small enhancements. Like we're shipping code in the cloud every six weeks, and we're shipping new versions twice a year for our Splunk Enterprise customers. And so this is kind of like, um, if you've seen that movie, Sophie's Choice, you know, where you have to pick one of your children. Like this was a really hard, hard thing to pick, because we only had about 25 minutes, but we did like four demos that I think landed really well. Um, the first was what we call ingest actions, and you know, there's customers that are using, they start small with gigabytes, and they go to terabytes, and up to petabytes of data per day, and so they wanted tools that allow them to kind of modify, filter, and then route data to different sort of parts of their infrastructure. So that was the first demo. Um, we did another demo on our, our visual playbook editor for SOAR, which has improved quite a bit. You know, a lot of the uh, analysts that are in the, in, the, uh, in the SOC trying to figure out how to automate responses and reduce sort of time to resolution, like they're not Python experts. Um, and so having a visual playbook editor that lets them drag and drop and sort of with a few simple gestures create complex playbooks was pretty cool. Um, we showed some new capabilities in our APM tool. Um, last year we announced we acquired a company called Plumber, which has expertise in basically like code level analysis and, and we're calling it all, always on profiling. Uh, so we, we did that demo. And gosh, we did one more, um, four, but four total demos. Um, I think, yeah. you know, people were really happy to see, you know, the thing that we really tried to do was ground all of our sort of like tech talk in stuff that was like real and today. Like this is not some futuristic vision. I mean, Sean did lay out some, some great visions, yeah. visionary kind of pillars, but what we showed in the keynote was like, it's, it's all shipping. I mean, code. there's plenty of headroom in this market when it comes to data as value and data in motion, all these things. Uh, but we were talking before you came on camera earlier in the morning about actually how good Splunk product and broad and deep the product portfolio is. It's Splunk. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not a utility and a tooling. It's a platform with tools and utilities. Yeah. It's fully blown out yeah. platform. Yeah. Yeah, it is a platform and, and you know, it's, it's one that's quite interesting. I've had the pleasure to meet a couple of big customers and it's kind of amazing like what they do with Splunk. Uh, like I was meeting with a, a large telco on the East Coast and you know, they actually, for their set top boxes, they actually have to figure out in real time which adds to display. And the only tool they could find to process 15 million events in real time to decide what add to display was Splunk. Um, so that was, that was like really cool to hear. Like we never set out to be like an ad tech kind of platform and yet <laughs> we're the only tool that operates at that level of scale and that kind of data. You know, it's funny, Doug Merritt mentioned this in my interview with him earlier today about, you know, and he wasn't shy about it, which is great. He's like, we're an enabling platform. We don't have to be experts in all these vertical industries yep. because AI takes care of that. That's where the machine learning and yeah. the applications get built. So yeah. others are trying to build fully vertically integrated stacks into these verticals yeah. when in reality, they don't have to, they don't you, you want know, to. Yeah, and Splunk's kind of, it's quite interesting when you look across our top 100 customers, you know, Doug talks about like the, you know, 92 of the Fortune 100 are kind of using Splunk today, but the diversity across industries and, you know, we have government agencies, we have, uh, you know, you name the retail or the vertical, you know, we've got really big customers there using Splunk. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I kind of, I was excited about, we announced the last demo I forgot was TrueStar integration with enterprise security, that's pretty cool. We're calling that Splunk Threat Intelligence. And so um, that was really fun. And we only acquired, we closed the acquisition to TrueStar in May, mm -hmm. but the good news is they've been a partner with us like for 18 months yeah. before we actually bought them. And so they'd already done a lot of the work to integrate. And so uh, they had a running start in that regard. Um, but other, one other one that was kind of a, it, it was a small thing, I didn't get to demo it, but we talked about the, uh, the content pack for application performance monitoring. Yeah. And so, you know, in some ways we compete in the APM level, but in many ways there's a ton of great APM vendors out there that customers are using. But what they wanted us to do was like, hey, if I'm using APM for that one app, I still want to get data out of that and into Splunk because Splunk ends up being like the core repository for observability, security, IT ops, DevSecOps, et cetera. It's kind of like where the truth 
the operational truth of how your systems works lives in Splunk. It's so funny, the Splunk business model has actually been replicated, they call it data lake, whatever you want to call it. People are bringing up all these different metaphors. But at the end of the day, if you guys can create a value proposition where you can have data just be you know, stored and dumped, or dumped into whatever you want to call it, stored in a we way. We call it ingest. Ingested, ingested. Yes. Not dumped. <laughs> data dump. It's uh, ingested. Well, I mean, well, you can manipulate it, but it's not, you don't have to do a lot of work to store it. Just, okay, yep. we're going to get to it later, but let yep. the machines take over yep. with machine learning. I totally get that. Now, as a, pro as a product leader, um, I have to ask you your, your mindset around optimization. What do you optimize for? Because a lot of times these use cases are emerging. <laughs> they just pop out of nowhere. It's a net new use yep. case that you want to operationalize. So balancing the headroom, yep. or not to foreclose those new opportunities for customers, how are customers deciding what's important to them? How do you, because you're trying to read the tea leaves for the future, bit, yeah. and then go, okay, what do customers need? but you don't want to foreclose anything. How do you think about the product strategy? There's a that? ton of opportunity to interact with customers. We have this thing called the customer advisory board. We run, I think four of them and we run a monthly. And so we got an opportunity to kind of get that anecdotal data and the direct contact. We also have a portal called ideas.splunk.com where customers can come tell us what they want us to build next. And we look at that every month. Um, you know, and there's no way that we could ever build everything that they're asking us to, but yeah. we look at that monthly and, it, and we use it in sort of our sprint planning to decide where we're going to yeah. prioritize engineering resources. Um, and it's just, it's kind of uh, like customers say the darndest things, right? Sometimes they ask us for stuff and we never imagined building it in a million years. Yeah. Um, like that use case around ads on a set top box. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's kind of a fun place to be. Like we, we just before this event, we kind of laid out internally what you know, Sean and I kind of put together this doc, actually Sean wrote the bulk of it, but it was about sort of what do we think, where, where can we take Splunk in the next three to five years? And we talked about these, we, we referred to them as waves of innovation, because you know, like when you think about waves, there's multiple waves that are heading towards the beach yeah. <laughs> in parallel, right? It's not like a series of phases that are going to be serialized, it's about making a set of investments that'll yeah. kind of land over time. And, and the first wave is really about, you know, what I would say is sort of, you know, really delivering on the promise of Splunk. And some of that's around integration, single sign-on, things about like making all of the Splunk, Splunk products work together more easily. Um, we've talked a lot, Nikita, about like edge and hybrid. And that's really where our customers are. If you watch Kobe yeah. Avital's sort of uh, yeah. customer keynote, you know, Walmart by necessity, given their geographic breadth and the customers they serve, has to have their own infrastructure. They use Google, they use Azure, yeah. and they have this abstraction layer that Kobe's team has built on top. Uh, and they use Splunk to manage kind of you know, you know, operate basically all of their infrastructure across those three clouds. Um, so that's the hybrid edge scenario. We, we're thinking a lot about, you mentioned data lakes. Um, you know, if you go back to 2002 when Splunk was founded, you know, the thing we were trying to do is help people make sense of log files. Yeah. But now, if, if you talk to customers that are moving to cloud, everybody's building a data lake. And there's like billions of objects flowing into yeah. millions of these S3 buckets all over the place. And we're kind of trying to think about, hey, is there an opportunity for us to point our indexing and analytics capability against structured and unstructured data in those data lakes? So that, that'll be something we're going to yeah. at least start prototyping pretty soon. And then lastly, machine learning. You know, I'd say, you know, to use a baseball metaphor, like in terms of like how we apply machine yeah. learning, we're like in the bottom of the second inning. Yeah. You know, we've been doing it for a number of years, but there's so much there's more so, that we could do. I mean, machine learning is only as good as the data you put into exactly. the machine learning. Exactly. <laughs> and so if you, have, if you have a gap in the data, the machine learning is going to have gaps in it. Yeah, and we, have, we announced a feature today called Auto Detect, and I won't go into the gory details, but effectively what it does is it runs a real-time analytics job over whatever metrics you want to look at. And you can do what I would consider more statistics versus machine learning. You can say, hey, if in a 10 minute period, like, you know, we see more errors than we, we see on average over the last week, throw an alert so I can go investigate yeah. and take a look. Um, imagine if you didn't have to figure out what the right thresholds were. If we could just watch those metrics for you and automatically understand the seasonality, the timing, is it a weekly thing, is it a monthly thing, and then yeah. like tell you like use machine learning to, to do the uh, anomaly detection, but do it in a way that's more intelligent than just the static threshold. Yeah. And so I think you'll see things like auto detect, which we announced this week, will evolve to take advantage of machine learning kind of under the covers, if you will. Yeah, it was interesting with cloud scale and the data velocity. Automation has become super important. You oh, have yeah. a lot of uh, new disciplines emerge, like explainable AI is hot right now. So you got, the puck is coming. You can see where the puck is going. Yeah. And that is automation at the app edge yep. or the application layer where the data has got to be free flowing or addressable. Yeah. Um, this is something that um, 
is being talked about. And we talked about data divide with, with Chris earlier about the policy side of things. And, and that data is part of everything. It's part of the apps. It's yeah. not just stored stuff. So it's always in flight. It should yeah. be addressable. This is what people want. What do you think about all that? No, I think it's great. I actually, just can I, I'll quote from Steve Schmidt in, in sort of the keynote. He said, look, like security at the end of the day is a human problem, but it kind of manifests itself through data. And so being able to understand what's happening in the data will tell you like, is there a bad actor like wreaking havoc inside of my systems? And like, you can use that, the data trail, if you will, yeah. of the bad actor to chase them down and, and sort of isolate them. The digital footprints, if you yeah. will, kind of trail. Yeah. All right, what's the coolest thing that you like right now? When you look at the treasure trove of, of uh, value, um, as you look at, and there's a range of value, Splunk's been, Splunk has had customers uh, come in with, with, with into the early product, but they keep the customers and they always do new things and they operationalize yeah. it. And another yeah. new thing comes, they operationalize it. What's the next new thing that's coming that's the next big thing? Dude, that is like asking me, which one of my daughters do I love the most? <laughs> like that is so unfair. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that one. Okay. Next question, All please. Right, okay, what's your goals for the next year or two? Yeah, uh, so I just kind of finished roughly my first 100 days and it's been great to, you know, I had a whole plan, 30, 60, 90, and I had a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to do. Um, like I'm really hoping sort of we get past this current kind of COVID scare and we get to back to normal because I'm really yeah. looking forward to getting back on the road and sort of meeting with customers. Um, you know, you can meet over Zoom and that's great, but what I've learned over time, you know, I used to go, I'd fly to Wichita, Kansas and actually go sit down with the operators like at their desk and watch how they use my tools. And that actually teaches you like, you, you come up with things when you see, you know, yeah. your product in the hands of your customer yeah. that you don't get from like a cab meeting or from yeah. a Zoom call, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so being able to visit customers where they live, where they work and kind of like understand what we can do to make their lives better. Like that's going to, I'm actually really excited to get back to travel. If you could give advice to CTO, CISO or um, CIO or practitioner out there who are, who's, who's sitting at their virtual desk or their physical desk thinking, okay, the pandemic's, we're coming through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I want to come out with a growth strategy, with a plan that's going to be expansive, not restrictive. Um, the pandemic has shown what's, what works, what doesn't work. Sure. So there's going to be some projects that might not get renewed but this doubling down on certainly with cloud scale. What, what advice would you give that person when they start to think about, okay, I got to get my architecture right. Yeah. I got to get my playbooks in place. I got to get my people aligned. Yeah. What's, what do you see as a best practice for kind of the mindset to actual implementation of data, managing the data? Yeah, and again, I'm, I'm, this is not an original Gar thought. It actually came from one of our customers. You know, the, I think we all, like you, you think back to March and April of 2020 as, as this thing was really getting real everybody moved as fast as they could to either scale up or scale, scale down operations. If you were in travel and hospitality, you know, that was a, you know, you had to figure out how to scale down quickly, and like what you could shut down safely. Um, if you were like in the food delivery business, you had to figure out how you could scale up. Like Chipotle hit two, what is it, $2 billion run rate on delivery last year. Um, and so people scrambled as fast as they could to sort of adapt to this new world. And I think we're all coming to the realization that as we sort of exit and get back to some sense of new normal, there's a lot of what we're doing today that's going to persist. Like, I, I think we're going to have like flexible rules. I don't think everybody's going to want to come back into the office. And so I think, I think the thing to do is you think about w returning to whatever this new normal looks like yeah. is like, what did we learn that was good? And like the pandemic had a silver lining for yeah. folks in many ways. And yeah. it, it sucked for a lot. Like, I'm not saying it was a good thing, but you know, yeah. there were things that we did to adapt that I think actually made like the workplace like stronger and better and, yeah. and sort of. It, show, it showed that, that data's important, internet's important, didn't break, internet didn't break. Correct. Zoom was amazing and a teleconferencing with other yep. tools. Um, but, that, but that's kind of the gist is sort of like, what did you learn over the last 18 months that you're going to take forward into the next 18 years? You yeah. know what I mean? Because yeah. there was a lot of good and I think people were creative and they figured out like how to adapt super quickly yeah. and take the best of the pandemic and turn it into like yeah. a better place Hy to work. Hybrid events, hybrid workforce, yep. hybrid workflows. What's, the, what's your vision on um, Splunk as a tier one enterprise? Because a lot of the news that I'm seeing that's, that's, that's another, the tell sign to me in terms of this next growth wave is big SI deals, Accenture mm -hmm. and others, mm -hmm. or yours I was working with. And you still got the other partner verse going, you know, re, the ecosystems yeah. emerging. Yep. That's a good, that means your product's enabling people to make money, yep. right? So yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. good thing. Yeah, Blue Voyant was a great example in the keynote yesterday. And they, you know, they've really, they've kind of figured out how you know, most of their customers, they serve customers in heavily regulated industries, kind of, and, you know, those customers actually want their data in a Splunk tenant that they own and control. And, and they want to have that uh, secure boundary around that. But Blue Voyant's figured out how they can come in and say, hey, I'm going to take care of the heavy lifting of the day-to-day -day operations, the monitoring of that environment. Mm -hmm. 
with the security. So, so Blue Boyan has done a great job sort of pivoting and figuring out how they can add value to customers and do, um, you know, because they, they're managing not just one Splunk instance, but they're yeah. managing hundreds of Splunk cloud instances. And so they've got best practices and automation that they can apply across their entire client base. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. um, and and Teresa's just, Teresa is just, she loves partners. Yeah. Absolutely loves partners. And that was just obvious. You could, yeah. you could hear it in her voice. You could see it in her body language, you know, when she yeah. talked about partner first. So um, I think you'll see us start to really get uh, a lot more serious because as, bi as big as Splunk is, like our pro server and support teams are not going to scale for the next 10,000, 100,000 Splunk customers. Yeah. And we really need to like really think about how we use partners. There's a real growth wave there. And, yeah. I, and I love the multiple waves in parallel because I think that's what everyone's consensus on. So um, I have to ask you as a final question, what's your takeaway? Obviously there's been a virtual studio here where all the Splunk executives and, and, and customers and partners are here, the Cube's here, um, doing all the presentations live by the way, it was mm -hmm. awesome. What would you say the takeaway is for this.com, for the people watching and consuming all the content online, a lot of asynchronous consumption going to be happening. Sure. What's your takeaway from this year's Splunk.com? You know, I, um, it, it's hard because you know you get so close to it and we've rehearsed this thing so many times. Um, you know, the feedback that I got, and if you look at Twitter and you look at my Slack and everything else, like this felt like a comp that was like, kind of like a really genuine, almost like a Splunk 2.0, but it, it's sort of true to the roots of what Splunk was, true to the product reality. I mean, you know, I was really careful with my team to avoid any whiff of vaporware. Like what, yeah. we're, what we wanted to show was like, look, this is Splunk, we're acquiring companies, you know, 43 major releases, you know, hundreds of small ones. Like we're continuing to innovate on your behalf as fast as we can. Um, and hopefully this is the last virtual comp. But even when we go back, like there was so much good about the way we did this this week that you know, when, we, when we broke yesterday on the keynote and we were sitting around with the crew and, and kind of looking at that stage and everything, we were like, wow, there is a lot of this that we want to bring to yeah. an in-person event as well. Because yeah. yeah. um, so for those that want to travel and come sit in a room with us, we're super excited to do that as soon as we can. Um, but, th but then you know, there may be 25, 50, 100,000 yeah. that don't want to travel, yeah. but can access us via this It's in, like a, this time, it's a, it's a yeah. moment in time that becomes a timeless moment. That wow. could be an Did you make that up right now? That could, that could be an NFT. Yeah. We could make a, a little cryptocurrency. Garth, great to see you. Of course I made it up right then. So great to see air you. Airbump, airbump. <laughs> right. Okay, good. Okay, Garth Ford, Senior Vice President, Chief Product Officer in the Cube here. We're live on site at Splunk Studio for the dot com virtual event. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching. All right, thank you guys.